Hey, it's Jim Johnston. I'm here today with Andrew Pope on his Picking It Out podcast. I hope you'll hang around and check it out. Well, it's another podcast. Just call Picking It Out. It's another podcast, y'all. Just call Picking It Out. We got the legendary Mr. Jim Johnston in the house. And we're going to be picking it out. Well, hey, y'all. Amazing how the power of music is, um, you know... It's it's like a uh, a grand a invitation that brings people together. It's just in- oh my god, man, it is. And I've had so many people on the show, uh, like the actor Tom Skerritt. You know, and he he saw a Detroit Symphony Orchestra rehearsal when he was a kid, and that was kind of his introduction into the arts. And he, then he saw Citizen Kane later on, and after that, he said he was hooked. But yeah, the there's music. Something, something about it. It, it just um, it taps into something in all of us that that uh, I, I think we still don't understand or something. But um, 100% agree. It, it it can be incredibly simple. It does not have to be polished. That's right. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I agree with Tom. I, I had a couple of uh, symphony experiences myself, and where I'm just, you know, I'm basically crying, and I don't, I don't even know why, but except oh. that I'm just so completely moved, yeah, emotionally, that it's the only reaction you can have. Yeah. Um. It's touching. It's moving. Um, it's healing. Yeah. You know, it's It really can't be explained, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do a, a plug for modern times, many aspects of which I'm not wild about. Um, I'm with you. The uh, It can also be divisive. And, you yeah. know, its power can be used sort of on the evil side as well. And I think there's a lot of music out there that is just uh, disgusting and and divisive and uh, is not bringing people together and is not celebrating the best parts of of us. And uh, and that's an incredible waste of a powerful tool. But we appreciate y'all tuning in this week once again with us here to Picking It Out. Um, last week, okay. If y'all hadn't seen that episode or, or listened to it, downloaded it, we were honored to have Dr. Harvey Schiller on the show. And let me tell you, we had one hell of a conversation. You know, a lot of people know him from, um, Turner sports. He's kind of the guy that famously sent Eric Bischoff home in 1999. But my God, he did so much more. He was one of the commissioners of the Southeastern Conference. He was a combat pilot in Vietnam, a chemistry professor. Just go check that episode out. He don't do a lot of interviews, so I was really honored to talk to him. It's a great uh, couple-hour conversation with Dr. Harvey Schiller. And subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um And tell your friends and just spread the word about the podcast here and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if you like it. And boy, we got another legend. I mean, huge legend as far as I'm concerned with us today. This guy has wrote almost every entrance theme in the WWF or the WWE in the last 
three decades. Um, just, I've always been under the, I've always had the opinion, I should say, these entrances, when they started becoming a thing in wrestling, like when I was a little kid, was just as important, if not more than the match itself or the character itself. So we're going to get into it here. Uh, we got Mr. Jim Johnston with us. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I was uh, admiring his studio setup uh, before we hopped on the air. Mm. And uh, we were talking about he had some family in Arkansas. Uh, so... Yeah, that's, you know, where the, that's where the roots are. Well, the roots the roots are important. The roots are important, yeah. Both my folks are buried there, Pocahontas, and um, my brother and his family uh, don't live in Pocahontas, but still live in Arkansas. Uh, and it's it's one of those great... Uh, well, there, there are tons of places, you know, the... The, the media and Hollywood and television, they're very misleading. And you'd think that the only great places to, to go visit are, um, you know, the beaches of California or uh, Mexico or Canada or Europe. And there are all these unbelievable places in the whole middle of this country that just take your breath away. And I, I've been to a bunch in Arkansas, <clears throat> just incredible, beautiful, pristine rivers. Um, and thank, it's sort of like, thank God nobody knows about them because if they knew about it, they would most definitely go screw them up or something. Or, oh, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> fill them with trash. Yeah, exactly. And, um, there is a lot of that. You know, here in Alabama, too, and uh, God, I mean, Georgia, Tennessee. Yeah. I think the South kind of gets a bad rap, which I understand some of it. But, man, there's some pretty country out here. It's beautiful, and the bad rap is largely uh, based on stuff from a long time ago. And Yeah, sure. Uh, and... The, the greater world often treats the South like uh, they just, I don't know, are set in stone and nothing's ever changed. And that's simply not accurate. Did, what kind of music? I've always been interested to know uh, what kind of music you grew up with. Um, <clears throat> my grandmother was very... Uh, very active in her church. So she, when we'd go over to her house, she was always uh, singing or playing piano or something and generally in a, a churchy direction. Mm -hmm. um, it, that, that whole thing is interesting because all the, for the most part, all the greatest singers grew up in the church. So there's, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of hymns. You know, they're, they're lyrically kind of uh, a little obtuse and uh, the melodies are hard to follow. But there must be something to it that's happening there because it, it sure produces, uh, you know, a lot of the greatest singers we've ever had. And um, so that... Um, my parents like to listen to uh, kind of the pop stuff of their era. And um, so I listened to that and I, I didn't realize I was studying at the time, but I was noticing different things about it. Like the Burt Camfort orchestra, I always noticed he had this very plucky bass that, that he mixed really hot in his recordings, which was very unusual. And it was the first time that I ever had a, a sense of someone or some band or uh, some entity having their own sound. 
like I, I, I didn't need anyone at six years old. I didn't need anyone to tell me if that was a Burt Camford orchestra uh, recording. I mean, it just had a, a sound. And so, and then later I, like, like most people, I grew up on the Beatles and had, that was life changing. And, um, I don't know. I've always loved, uh, movie soundtracks. I guess that's what I, when I'm not listening to stuff that I'm working on, which is what most of the time, um, I guess I listen to soundtracks more than anything else. But other than that, singer songwriters, uh, James Taylor, um, I like a lot of Sting's stuff. Uh, um, I generally like country music, but more traditional country music. Um, I don't like the new popified uh, stuff. It's a little starting to feel a little too, um, I don't know. Um, a combination of uh, woke and um, manipulated. <clears throat> it lacks kind of the purity of classic country music story songs, and, which I love. And I, I, I lately, I have absolutely, completely loved uh, so many of the great cowboy songs that they've been using in the series Yellowstone <clears throat> because they're when I first started watching that show uh, my wife and I were hooked beyond hooked and um, they struck me as like cowboy hymns in a way and they're very deeply felt and they're they're all story songs about a lifestyle um, or a lifestyle that people feel is slipping away from us and, and uh, really powerful stuff. I, I like stuff that I'm all about feel in music. I, I'm not impressed with uh, people who can play 18 million notes shredding. You know, I'd rather have three really good notes. Um and complexity for the sake of complexity or showing off is just doesn't do it for me. I, I like something that's from the heart. When when I when I hear when I when I meet someone or uh, or I'm talking about someone, you know, uh, maybe doing a session for me, singing a song or something. When I ask them to send me some stuff that they've done in the past, I'm always very cautious to be specific of like, don't send me the stuff that you think is really commercial. Yeah. Send me the stuff that moves you, that, that, that you don't want to send out because, oh, no one will like that. Mm -hmm. you know? But for whatever reason, including reasons you can't explain, uh, you know, yes, I wrote this song and it completely still moves me to this day. And uh, I, that's the stuff I want to hear. Well, man, you got a lot in common. I can already tell <laughs> because I feel the exact same way about country music. I'm very, very damn passionate. Uh, and, and pretty much anybody listening to this, as far as music fans, um, they're the same way. I can guarantee you. Uh, how did you end up in Connecticut? My dad moved up to the New York area for work. Um, you know, not a lot. If you um, aspired to, you know, trying to make something to yourself, there wasn't a whole lot to make of yourself in Pocahontas, Arkansas. Yeah. And um he actually was uh my mom and dad got married and then a month later he got called up for World War Two and went over and uh was with the RAF in uh England for five straight years without a break coming home. 
um, and came back and uh, was a little bit lost, like a lot of the boys coming home at the time. Um, bought the local Buick dealership, borrowing some money from his dad and realized like within two days, he just made the hugest mistake of his life and, and then was just figuring out how to get out of it and, uh, and you know, head north. I mean, he'd had a good college education and uh, had gone to Wharton School of Business and he just knew he wanted to like take that out for a spin and see what he could do with it. So he got a job in New York and uh, ended up having a great career. So we stayed here, but, but still the, the vibe, Andrew was, uh, that home was Pocahontas, you know, and come summertime it'd be vacation was heading home. Uh, it kind of never leaves you. I feel like home never leaves you no matter where you go. It is. It's a, it's an odd kind of feeling. Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't been back to Pocahontas in, in years. And yet I think about it frequently. I can see it in my mind's eye and the square and, uh, my grandparents house and um it's amazing i was just I was just talking uh yesterday with my brother and we were talking about or he had mentioned suddenly you know i I'd, I'd love to go by our grandparents house and and i thought immediately it's like what a great idea you know uh and then we're both like, well, why would we ever do that? No, we're never going to be there. But there's just something about it. It's uh, it's that connection to that place. Yeah. How old would you have been uh, when your dad moved to New York? I was a little kid, five. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So to be five years old and still be, I mean, that's young. I can't remember. I can remember very few things when, when I was five and to still have that kind of home calling out to you connection. You know, that really says something. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's kind of hard to explain or I can't, it's not hard to explain. I can't explain it. Yeah. But it is what it is. I, you know, I think we're, we're still much more uh, animals than we think we are. And like, you can drag us away from an area, but we know we're from, you know, Montana. Like that's where the rest of the herd is. Yeah. It's a good way of saying it actually. <laughs> oh, uh, gets, I guess it gets in your bloodstream. I guess, uh, I guess you really always loved music kind of like myself. Oh, how did, yeah. How did you know that it was time that you explore that? Um, This probably wasn't the moment, but it certainly was a moment that sealed the deal. Uh, my parents had taken us to some amusement park or something. I don't know what the hell it was. Some big, big amusement park. And we're walking around and, uh, and suddenly in the distance, I hear music playing sort of, uh, early rock and roll. Real simple, early rock and roll, but obviously a live band. So I'm dragging my family over, you know, we, we have to go check this out. We have to go check this out. So we go around the corner and sure enough, there's a, a stage and an area and there's a band up there and it's, uh, and the band is all in like sparkling 
blue or red suits or something, and they're they're playing uh, this, uh, you know, very very rudimentary pop rock stuff of the time. And I was absolutely mesmerized. And I was, I, I, I can't imagine how they, my parents managed to drag me away from that, but they did. Because <laughs> nobody else was interested in staying. And I stayed all night. But, you know, it's interesting that that, that, that impressed me so much because you'd think like, oh, well, geez, uh, you know, that if to resonate that much, that obviously means you wanted to get up there and do that same thing. And as is pretty well covered and written about, um, I have deep stage fright issues. And so I'm definitely not a performer. Um, it, it's not something I enjoy. And it scares me to death. I, I feel like I'm going to pass out or throw up or... Um, but just the, the music, I, it just cut me right to my heart. It's amazing. So that was, that was, that was a big moment for me. It was like, holy crow. Like that is the coolest thing I have ever seen or heard in my life. It's like, who would want to not do that? Yeah. And uh, was it after that that you learned to play something, learned to play an instrument? or? Well, back then when schools actually respected art, um, you played in the band. You know, you, as a matter of fact, you had to try. Um, I think they made every kid give it a shot. So... Basically, you had to really try hard to not do it versus now where you have to try really hard to do it. And uh, so I didn't pick it, but I, I guess I was, you know, oh, OK, you're going to play trumpet. Uh, you know, they give you a trumpet and and but it was, you know, they give you lessons and you play in the band and you do some horrible little concert for the parents once a year. and. But still, it, it teaches you kind of basics and you get a feel for how instruments fit together and then to that different instruments are playing different parts at different times. And it, I guess it's one of those things where you don't really realize you're learning until about 20 or 30 years later. And you go like, huh, I think I knew that early on from that whole band experience. Yeah. So it was valuable. And um, then uh, my parents gave me piano lessons, which was kind of a thing of the day that you give your kid piano lessons. And uh, and I just hated the music that this lady was trying to teach me to play. I just couldn't understand, like, what is this the goal to learn to play these little songs you know i mean they're, they're meaningless to me I, it always struck me as so weird for people to try to teach kids music but not teach them to play stuff music that they would like that would maybe have some you know it's, it's probably the essence of why sesame street and the early kids programming was so successful because it was actually programmed for the kids yeah. to, to make the learning enjoyable. And um, so I did not luck into experiencing that. So I finally talked my parents out of uh, stopping that. And then uh, I wanted to play guitar, but after the, the, Quitting piano lessons happened. My dad didn't trust that I would follow through with it. So he wouldn't buy me a guitar. So we rented a guitar, rented an acoustic guitar, which was a really horrible guitar. You know, it was like the strings were visibly far away, had very little to do with the fretboard. <laughs> and uh, so, but I still, I practiced until my 
fingers bled and uh, just got a cord book and tried to piece it together. And then finally, uh, for Christmas, I got this horrible Kent electric guitar. Wow. Which I think possibly the strings were even further away from the fretboard. Jeez. And, uh, but hey, it was an electric guitar and I figured, hey, I'm in now, you know? So, <laughs> and I just played and played and played until I figured it out. Were they, uh, were they, was the action so high that you could just play slide on it? Just kind of put in your lap and just play slide. It was almost a dobro. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm picturing when you're telling me that. <laughs> yeah. Uh-uh. Jeez. Well, I mean, um, you know, I kind of had a similar, similar story. I, I wasn't in band, but I had piano lessons. Didn't really like the stuff I was getting taught and, how to hold your fingers, you know, and put a yeah. ruler across your fingers and all this crap. And I got a book, uh, and I'm telling you this because you'll get a kick out of it. I got a book, and it was TV theme songs. Oh, those are good things to learn because they're in your head. The, exactly. They, and, they have meaning. And, and I spent so much time, Jim, in my room when I was little, you know, watching Cheers, watching – you know, Magnum PI, MASH, mm -hmm. all these great shows. And my granddaddy, when I had, when I spent time with him, me and him watched the stuff together. So I see this, this, uh, songbook. I don't remember where it was at, but mama bought it for me. And I ended up taking lessons from this other guy. And he didn't try to teach me how to read. He tried to teach, he saw I could do it by ear. So he, he would just, he would play it, record it on a tape, and it was all theme songs. Uh, and I would go home, listen to it, and play and learn. That's how I learned to play the piano. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. That's and then later on, on yeah. yeah. By ear. And uh, later on, I picked up the guitar and kind of taught myself that. But, you know, I spent so much time, and those songs was in my head. I loved all kinds of different kinds of music, but I don't know why I was attracted to theme songs. Uh, they were such a big thing back then. I mean, it's that's a oh well, because they're, you know, it's it's like when 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 a wrestler has a, a theme that resonates with you. It's not just the music. It's a it's a bigger. It, it 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 brings with it a bigger world. It it takes you know you hear it and you are taken back emotionally to experience the excitement of the whole event associated with the music. And so those themes, you you know you have a favorite show. If, if it's Magnum PI, you you play that theme and you're you're thinking about you know. A red Ferrari and um, and your favorite episodes and and how good and that good feeling you get from watching those shows, it's it's a bigger thing. Again, looping back to the first thing, the power of music, it's incredible. Yeah, it really is. Um, well, how did you? I'm sure you've talked about all of this stuff before, but just so our audience knows, because um, it's an interesting story. I think I've always thought this, you know, how did you become into the film, uh, TV film business? I know you've done some things prior to working with Vince. Um, well, I guess more than anything happenstance, you know, you're, I, I knew I wanted to do this and there's, you know, unlike other jobs where there's a there's a pathway, you know, you want to be a lawyer. It's like, OK, you have to go to college and ideally get good grades and then get into the best law school you can. And you get really good grades there, work hard, study, go out in those summers while you're in law school and work as an intern at some uh, some law business and uh, 
and hopefully they hire you or you then go out and, and send out your resume to a, a bunch of law firms and hopefully get picked up and start your career. And, and then from there, everything's a go. In music, it's, it's not nearly so straightforward. There's, there's, you know, there's a lot of different avenues to go down. Is it, you know, or do you want to be a writer behind the scenes? Do you want to be the upfront guy and, uh, you know, out on the road playing, you know, and each of those is challenging. You're really on your own. There's no place you, you go to apply for the job. You, you have to, uh, it's basically starting your own business and you're, you have to first create a product to go out there and pedal and say, this is what I can do. And you hopefully get some little job that probably you're doing for free and, or probably a bunch of those. I did a bunch of things for free and just to create a tape, create a something to show the next person that yes, I can do this. So, um, I, I, I guess, thank God I was smart enough not to, um, limit myself to saying, you know, this is specifically the thing I want to do, but rather let the opportunities present themselves and walk through those doors as as people offer to open them for you and uh so that's what i did and um kind of one thing led to to another and uh, and i ended up uh doing a lot of different things i guess i was always attracted to doing a lot of different things only because i um i genuinely love most genres of music and I knew I didn't want to only do, you know, pop songs or rock and roll or uh, only orchestral stuff. I wanted to do it all. So I basically, uh, w which ended up being sort of a, a backwards sort of good thing because I was open to anything that came along. It wasn't like this sort of left field thing hit and I would say, oh, oh I, I don't. You know, I, I don't do that kind of music. Yeah. Um, and that served me well in, in the WWE years because, um, no matter what was requested, I was, you know, you want a Indian Punjabi pop song? Sure. Let's, let's go. You know, I'll hear <laughs> it out. And I, uh, do research on listen to a bunch of music and try to figure out, get that in my head or, is what is a Punjabi pop song? Uh, but I always found it fascinating doing it, doing the different things. Well, what was the first big thing um, that you were involved with, even before Vance, possibly that you that you kind of knew, like, hey, I, I might can make a living doing this. I did a bunch of stuff for. Uh, a lot of the cable networks, HBO and MTV. And, you know, so the first time you hear your music come out of a TV set is it, it it's attention getting. And you figure like, okay, you know, it's not a perfect piece of music, but they hired me. I have a check to show, to prove it. Uh, and now I'm listening to it come out my TV speaker. So, yeah, um, I can, I can do this. And were these bumpers? Um, oh, they were everything from bumpers to, uh, uh, you know, sort of score stuff for yeah. shows themselves that's all over the map. Thank wow. God. I like being all over the map. It's a good place to be. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Uh, um, well, how did Vince McMahon come into this picture during this time for you? I was one of the early uh, American adopters of sushi. Loved it. And there was only one restaurant in town, that little Japanese restaurant that offered it. And uh, 
at first they didn't even have a, a sushi bar, which is the, you know, typical scenario. Uh, it was just a, a Japanese hot food restaurant, but then he started preparing sushi in the back. And for people who knew, you know, you could go in and get some. And then he finally had enough people requesting it that he took a corner of his restaurant and put in a little tiny sushi bar. I think it was maybe four seats. Then he expanded it to maybe six or seven seats. And so if you went there, it was like going to your local bar. Mm. You'd see the same people all the time because not many people knew about it and certainly not many, you know, raw fish. I mean, you got to be crazy. I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat that. Um, and a guy I, I had sort of met and, you, you know, you just, hi, how you doing? Hey, uh, he came in one night and said, uh, Hey, I, didn't you say you write music? Um, I, I, my, my boss has me preparing a, a, a video for a cable TV convention and, uh, I, I can put the video together, but I have no idea how to add music to it, you know? And I said, sure. You know, I mean, at that point in my career, I said, sure. I, I, I didn't even have to hear the description of the <laughs> yeah. job. It was like, absolutely. I specialize in that. <laughs> I'm your man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so sure enough, I, I did it. And then uh, he called me over and said, uh, you know, we're going to go play it for my boss. And I said, okay. Hmm. Uh, and I, I didn't even know who it was. I, I wasn't then and very curiously never have been a, a, a fan of pro wrestling. Um, and so we go to his office and play it and he loved it. And then we were chatting and he was like, what else do you do? What else do you do, pal? Hey, pal. Yeah. Um, and, and we, uh, you know, very different people, but I guess we have some similarities and uh, we hit it off great. And, uh, and then from there out, it was, it just, quickly accelerated into a full on thing and quickly enough became a 24 seven thing. Well, who was the guy that you actually made contact with? Uh, that was a guy named Brian Penry, who was the, then uh, Vince's art director. Okay. And this is very beginning when Vince had bought the business from his dad. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people think walking into Vince's office, hmm, you know, that's a, they're like with, with, uh, a, a lot of fanfare. And it's like they were just renting a floor of a local little business building. Mm. It's like in one corner was Vince's office and the other corner was Linda's. And, uh, Brian had a kind of an area in the middle and, uh, it was a very small operation. Um, but boy, Vince was talk about a fire in a man's belly. So he was, he was on fire. Yeah. He, he was ready to change the universe, which as it turns out, he did. Sure. Uh, was Vince senior still alive at this point? I believe yes. Uh, however, I never met him. Never okay. Yeah. I think I think when he when Vance I mean Junior bought it, he kinda just nobody really saw him anymore. I've never heard anybody he just kinda was out of the picture, wasn't he? Andrew, I don't know too much about the details of that, but my impression, and this is truly an impression, and I could be utterly wrong, but my impression was that uh, that that he kind of only sold it to Vince because he was done. Yeah. So, um, and I, I guess that 
uh, gave him the permission to retire, basically. But I don't know, you know, maybe the guy was sick already at that time and knew he had to get out. Um, I have no idea. But yeah, he, it, it was, uh, it certainly like he wasn't in Vince's office standing over the kid's shoulder saying, do this and do that. Yeah. It was Vince's baby from that, that day out. But things changed so fast. You know, he, when Vince's dad had it, it, it's almost hard to imagine now that, that there was no music. I mean, it, yeah. it's literally a dry auditorium, no lights, no pyro. I mean, just some lights right on the ring. But, yeah. you know, two guys would just literally walk out, yell at each other a little bit, mix it up a little bit. Some guy would get pinned. Blah, blah, blah. They walk out. Two two other guys walk in, yell at each other a little bit, mix it up a little bit, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I think about those days, and you have to give those guys a lot of credit because they had no help. I mean, mm-hmm. if, the, if, the, if it was going to be entertaining at all, it was 100% up to the wrestler. Yeah. Uh, to sell their character, sell whatever storyline, you know, I'm incredibly angry with this other guy and I just, I've got to take him down and he betrayed me last week. And um, that's the guts of the thing. It's such an interesting business. What you said before, I couldn't agree with more. It's um, the, the music made it entertaining, sort of like a, a concert or a rock show or something. And, and it added this deep layer of emotion to these characters. And it also gave them uh, an, an environment or, or a, um, it gave them a, a bigger emotional stage to come alive in. Yeah. And it, it was also why it was so important for me to, to try to nail the theme for people so that they could dance to that. It always struck me. It was like a dance is and the, the, the person had to be able to, to dance to that theme naturally in a way that fit their character. That's true. Um, well, after this initial meeting, you know, with Vance, did he pretty much, did he lay this whole thing out like, hey, I see, you know, we're going to make a spectacle out of this. You know, on their way to the ring, we're going to have actual entrance themes. It's going to be, you know, I mean, it really wasn't theatrical. Not that I recall. I, I think that maybe he had that in his mind. But uh, from a practical level, it was just uh, building step by step. And, uh, you know, we, we saw that something worked yeah. and something worked, you know, you went with it and, uh, you know, but, I, but I was always, um, less going with it in the sense that once I did something for someone that, you know, a theme that was working, or a show theme that worked or whatever, um, I felt a lot of pressure to do something, find something completely different for the next guy. Mm. But he didn't want the classic gimmick infringement problem. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, which I know this is a gigantic tang- tangent jump forward, but it's what is so horrible about where things are now because everything's the same all the all the themes sound exactly the same if if you're in the next room you can't tell who's coming out and i to me that's that's a big problem now you're now you're working against yourself rather than working for yourself which is not not good i i couldn't agree more you've lost that that special thing to your character now, I feel like. Man, I remember going to live events 
And when that music hit, or when the lights went out and then the music hit, I that was so damn exciting as a kid. I mean, I, I would that stuck with me more than the moves, you know, and the the who who won the match even. Well, I think and that's I, pretty typical, and and I think it's pretty natural too because um, I think one of the problems with the business is there. The, the wrestling, it's not that exciting, the wrestling itself. I mean, it's a little bit exciting. And some of the guys who really do acrobatic stuff, you know, you, you can't help but be amazed. It's like, oh, a pro. I mean, but at the same time, now it seems like there's so much pressure for these some of these guys to stand out. It just starts to feel foolish and dangerous to me. It's like, you know, this is... This is just asking for an enormous problem of, of someone getting paralyzed or something. Um, and most importantly, I don't think most people really give a damn about it. I mean, you know, I don't think it really resonates. I, I, I think what resonates is uh, you get that feeling in a, when you're in an arena that. 45 seconds after these two guys had started wrestling, the the fever pitch in the audience is they can't wait or who's coming out next. Yeah. Um, they're ready to move on. Uh, so the only matches that are really entertaining are the guys who are good enough actors or who recognize that the business is about acting, not about wrestling, um, to to sustain some drama and in the storyline and to make it really feel like there's uh there's a story here that it isn't just wrestling it's there and because if there's too much wrestling it starts to just become i don't know an exhibition or something and Mm -hmm. uh, and a relatively meaningless meaningless one at that yeah that's a very good point um, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with, with everything that you said there, you know, uh, even TV shows and stuff like them taking the theme songs away or cutting, cutting them down to five, 10 seconds. It's just, you know, there's bit, there's something missing. Well, so they're missing the point of what the entertainment is yeah. about and what people care about, yeah. it, you know, and we've gotten to a point where. The experts always know better mm-hmm. than me. I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by this whole thing, especially because you was not a wrestling fan. So it I got grief for that, by the way. I got grief from that from my boss, who was uh, the executive producer, who, who would frequently give me grief saying, Jim, you got to watch the shows. And I said, I don't, I don't want to watch the shows. I mean, and he goes, uh, well, you know, you, you will, you, you have to watch the shows to really be in touch with uh, what you need to be writing. And, I, you know, I, and I'm like, well, Every bit of evidence seems to point exactly 180 degrees away from what you just said. <laughs> my argument is it's my very distance from this that that makes me or allows me to be good at it because I'm not I'm not a mark guy. I'm I'm a composer. It's it it's it's the same dynamic as John Williams writes the score to E.T. He doesn't have to be an expert in extraterrestrials or be a hobby guy who loves astronomy to write that score. He's a composer who's looking at the product and determining what is what do we need to make the audience feel here? What What's the emotion that needs to happen here? And like, well, when it's Steve Austin, it's anger and, and uh, control against the man. And when it's Undertaker, it's mystical. It's 
uh, darkness. It's the other side. It's the mystery of what's going on in worlds that we don't understand. Um, that's what people have to feel. And as a composer, the only way I've found to get there is until I'm playing something that makes me feel that, then I'm an idiot to think that anybody else is going to feel it. Well, you nailed it. You nailed it. Cause I was going to say, I was going to ask, you know, about watching it after you became involved with writing for the characters and stuff for the themes, if you watched it, but that's exactly right. I mean, it, I'm, I just try to put myself in the shoes like of, of you. Like, I feel like I would have to, I would maybe want to meet with them, kind of feel them out, see who they are, who their character is going to be. Maybe kind of see how they present themselves, you know, but just for timing issues, you know, like the. Generally, uh, meeting with them does not help. And I really? something I very rarely did because. That, well, because they tend to, you know, uh, they know the wrestling business. They don't know the music business. And uh, I, and I don't want that to sound condescending or something. It's it's like, well, I go to the doctor, but I don't know the doctor business, which is yeah. why I go to the doctor. Yeah. Uh, if I knew it, I'd just consult myself. But... Um, so when you meet with the guy or the girl, whichever you, you tend to hear what they like to listen to in their car or what they like to work out to against, uh, in, in the gym or they're new and they have lofty goals. It's like, you know, I want something with the same kind of energy as Steve Austin and, you know, it's like, well, no, I, I I already finished Steve's Steve's theme and it's his. You know, I can't write you another one. Uh, so most of the time, it was uh, just getting any sort of little piece of film on them, just see how they move, what their tempo is. I I came to see how everybody has an internal clock and an internal tempo. Um, and you gotta, you have to find that tempo because when they're coming down the ramp, you don't want the music to rush them, but you also don't want the music to hold them back. So it's, it's got to move at their heart rate. Yeah. So, you know, you, you've got something like Ultimate Warrior. So that got, you know, that, that moved at the tempo he ran out there and, and at the tempo he sh- would shake the ropes. And uh, Austin's tempo, it's upbeat, but it's not fast, uh, but it's not plodding either. It's confidently driving, you know, just coming relentlessly at you, which was his tempo. And uh, Undertaker is, you know, is is non-tempo it's it's a a a feeling a a being something so you know razor ramon is a street guy you know just a cool and tempo was always a sort of a starting point for me and it's interesting how you can try different tempos and if it would play the like the first night that we run it with the character, I could tell in two seconds if it was right or wrong seeing the guy come out to it. You could literally see if the tempo's wrong that the the person's not can't quite get moving right. You know, yeah. it's, it's you, you feel like they start to walk and, and then they they'll stop. <laughs> And I, I'm absolutely confident that they are utterly unaware that that's happening. But that when the tempo's right, it's they can completely let go and be their character. And it's one of the things that makes me feel particularly sad about the current state of things. Um, because the neither WWE 
or AE, AEW, right? That's the other one, AEW. Yeah, yeah, AEW. Uh, they're not producing stars like Austin or Rock or Undertaker. And it's, I think it's largely because the music is horrible. And because who would know if this guy has the capability of being a star? I mean, it's like they're, they're stuck with bad storylines, bad music, uh, generic. They all look the same. They all, you know, have the tough guy, short beards, you know, eighth inch beards and, um, and a couple of guys almost break out, but then it seems like they, they don't get storylines that allow them to truly break out and become themselves. I thought Bray Wyatt had a, a shot because he was a, a different kind of character. Um, I don't know, you know, and then if someone gets close, it seems like they ram them down the audience's throat. You know, uh, Roman Reigns is, it, it, I, I mean, and then I'm sort of talking out of my butt here because I don't really watch. So it's just from the, occasionally I stumble upon the channel and see it, but it, it feels forced. Yeah, it but does. more than anything, it just seems generic. It's like all these guys look, act, move, talk the same way, and there's there seems to be no storyline except that someone comes out one night out of the blue, and there's like I'm incredibly pissed off at Joe, and yeah. it's like, well, why are you pissed off? Well, I'm incredibly pissed off at Joe. Yeah, but why? I, I'm I'm going to kill Joe. You know, there is no storyline. Yeah, it's just he was told to go out there, and you're pissed off at Joe. I feel like some of the individuality of of the characters have been taken away. It's similar in music. It is absolutely similar in music, and it's so damn devastating. It's all about spectacle now in music. It's yeah, it's not yeah. about. Are are you a great musician and are you writing great songs? No, means something to people. It's uh, can you distinguish yourself by writing lyrics that are so offensively disgusting that they shouldn't even be out there, but you get noticed, right? So if you're the next person in line, is like, oh, I can write something far more disgusting than that yeah the noise you hear is my cat by the way oh i, that yeah, I hear <laughs> that decided just to hop up and start raising hail for some reason That's right. mm-hmm. um now she's trying to get in my lap here yeah. gracie hop down that's okay um well you know did vince know you wasn't a wrestling fan when you uh- yeah, and he did, it didn't bother him. Smart at all. guy, Vince is a smart guy. Not, not not a whole lot gets by him. Yeah, uh, he's he's generally speaking, kind of one step ahead of most people. He's an interesting guy. Um, do you remember like what the first? thing he wanted you to do was well the first thing was that cable tv score deal that i did uh when i met him yeah uh, after that um I, I i think i did a wrestlemania theme maybe i don't i don't i don't the, the answer to your question is no i don't really remember it's just uh you know, each each thing that I did, that we did, uh, it it sort of elevated the entertainment value of the program so much. You know, adding music and emotion to the things that it just uh, it, it it just accelerated. It was like an exponential curve of like, oh my god, okay, now so this 
magazine show needs a theme. Okay, this needs a theme. Okay, this guy, you know, I think he, he, he you know, early on, you didn't get a theme as a wrestler in, until you were like a star guy. Yeah. You, know, you had to be way up the ladder to get a theme. So it was like, well, you know, uh, this guy's going to get a push or, you know, this guy's really popular with, the, and we should give him a theme. And then it was, uh, and then f- for a lot of the early years, uh, uh, heels never got a theme. Like only babies got a theme. And I always, I always disagreed with that. It's like, wait a second. A heel is not, someone you truly hate it's someone you love to hate love to hate yeah uh so let's help people love to hate them yeah uh so vince eventually went with uh music for heels but it in the beginning it was never he never allowed it to be good music you know or or barely music you know it was like toilet flushes or uh Yeah, yeah something that clearly said we hate this guy <laughs> yeah um so eventually um eventually that changed thank god you know it's because every so some of the some of the great things are when it's a heel that's times when the music hate uh, it works the best it it you know like in movies generally storylines plot lines work the best or are dependent most upon how effective is the bad guy it's not how cool the good guy is it's like we already know superman's a good guy and will save the day it's how you know the joker i mean the the, the joker became almost bigger than batman because good. he was a great bad guy uh hannibal lecter and uh, Silence of the Lambs. I mean, when you have a a really powerful bad guy, it makes the good people much, much better because it makes their plight so much harder. So there's more sacrifice involved. And so the storyline is more believable and it's more, uh, it's just infinitely more powerful. So it's, you you have to raise up the power of the bad guys to make the good guys good. Absolutely. You know, if the good guy can just come in the room and beat the shit out of everybody and it's no big deal. Yeah. You haven't got much of a story. No, you don't. And thank God for the heels. Yeah. You know, they, they became, they became kind of the baby faces at a certain point there, like in the nineties. Yeah. Uh, no, it was cool to be Man. bad. Yeah, it was it was it was crazy time during that time there. Uh you uh I guess what is your favorite thing that you ever wrote? That's probably a wide open question, but I'm interested because there's so many different uh types of material. Yeah, I it, it it really is an impossible question to answer, you know, because there there are different things I I like at different times, and um, and also I I have this dynamic that um, I've read that a, a not maybe not a lot, but many writers have. Um, I think it's probably tends to be writers who have a lot of output. Um, you know, if written, if someone's written three songs in their lives, I, I doubt that they're feeling this, but um, where there's a, a letting go thing that happens, not, 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 I let go. I mean, it's not that, that, Oh, each one of these is my own little baby and I set them free to live their life. You know, it's like, no, just shoot me when I say that. 
Um, <laughs> Thank you for saying that. It, it's more that they just leave, you know, yeah. and, uh, and when I hear them, you know, a year later, I hear them as if they were somebody else's song and I can enjoy them as if they were somebody else's song. Like, Oh, I love that song, you know, but it's not said like, gee, Jim, you really are great. You know, yeah, I love that song and you wrote it. (laughs) There's no ownership to it whatsoever. It's like, Oh, I love that song. Um, The proof of that, there were a couple of times that I would be in an arena and someone would come in and their theme would play. And I would be like, wait a second. Like, what is this? This is really cool. Like, did did this guy come in with his own theme or something? Or, you know, did Vince reach out to somebody else that I don't know about? And then like 45 seconds later, I realized like, oh, oh, yeah, that's you. (laughs) (laughs) but it's really a strange feeling because it it, it's like whose music is this wow and finally what what will throw it is i'll hear myself do a guitar some guitar lick that is something that i probably use too much so it's definitely me and (laughs) oh yeah yeah (laughs) I'll go like, oh, okay. Well, there you go. Uh, I mean, but, Vance but, pretty much. Sorry, but that that was a, a real tangent away from answering your question. So relative to that, I hear different things. So just like you're in a different mood day to day as to what you put on in your car or what radio station you turn on, um, my answer to that question is different all the time, but at the same time, it's generally, um, you know, it's a combination of what most people are going to say, which they, they tend to, the favorites tend to be the most popular guys. And, you know, it's one of those strange dynamics in life where, you know, where's, Where's the best place to fish? Where do, where do, where do people, you know, where, where's my best chance to catch fish? Well, you know, I think below the dam is a good spot. You know, people seem to have good luck there. It's like, well, of course they do, because that's where everybody fishes. Yeah. 98% of the people who fish on that river fish below the dam. So fishing below the dam is going to get a really good reputation as a place to catch fish. It right. probably is not the best place to fish on the river. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's uh, so, you know, do I like the Rock's theme and Austin's theme and everything? I certainly love Undertaker's theme. Um, but uh, it, it tends to be sort of the lesser known things that for some reason move me in particular. I'm the same way with my songs. You know, my favorite ones, I guess, that I've written are ones that a handful of people have heard. Some, well, some of them nobody's heard. Well, see, then that is something that I would get after you on and say you're you're missing the opportunity. Those if those things that move you, you have to have the the faith and the trust that they if they're moving you. They will move other people. So that means what you're putting out is the stuff that you feel is more commercial. And you're holding back the stuff that's going to move people emotionally and say like, oh, my God, I love that song. You know, I'm pretty emotional in my music. Uh, I'm not really what you would call commercial as far as... uh, you know, I, I tend to lean toward the older school country. I'm kind of, that's just who I am. Yeah. Um, but this cat is going insane for some reason. Oh, uh, but yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. And, uh, maybe I do need to give that a, another thought and get some of those out there. It's, it's, uh, 
it's scary. I mean, trust me, I know, I know the dilemma. It's, um, it's so easy to talk ourselves down to, to convince yourself is like, oh, well, no, that, that just, that's just something that appeals to me. You know, that's, that's, that's not going to appeal to that's, you know, most people are not going to, they're not going to get that somehow, you know, they don't, won't kind of understand what the song's about. And, you know, it doesn't really have a nice repetitive chorus to it or anything. And, you know, it's just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put that up. And, and yet if you're just playing for yourself, it's, that's the one you go back to and play. That's true. You have to ask yourself, why is that? And that's the mystery of music, but it's the whole thing. Uh, and it's taken me a long time to figure out and I'm still figuring it out because I'm horrible uh, about putting stuff out. I, I can find any reason to procrastinate and any reason not to do it. Uh, what saved me in that regard was the incredible intensity of WWE where the schedule is uh, insane. You know, I'd, I'd get a call at four o'clock in the afternoon that, okay, they're debuting some new guy that evening on the sh- on Monday Night Raw, and oh. you, you got to come up with a theme, you know. And now maybe it's not going to be the final recording of that theme, but you got to get something that's at least good enough to get the guy out to the ring and establish a character. And that happened all the time. And so that kind of deadline and pressure on me took this, uh, all this sort of uh, insane insecurity and uh, shyness and uh, second guessing out of my, out of my way. I had no choice, but since being out of WWE and now I'm my own gatekeeper, it's like, I'm horrible. It's horrible. And something that I really am working hard to get over because I have so much music I'd love to get out. And, you know, as a perfect example and proof of what I'm saying, um, months and months ago, I took my website down to rebuild it because I it basically uh, brought on by what I was changing domain hosts. And I, I said, okay, so this is going to be my big stopping off point. I'm going to take it down, change hosts, get that all the business end of it straightened away, get the website back up and running. And then I'm going to start, you know, releasing two pieces a week of new music that I've done. I haven't even got the website back up. It's horrible. You know, it's just horrible. And it's, it's something I say with complete shame and embarrassment. And as a a lesson to everyone who is listening out there is this is a faith issue. You, you have to have trust and faith that for whatever reason, God gave you the talents you have. And so your part of the deal is you got to do stuff with that talent and put it out there. And, and if someone doesn't like it, well, fine, they're not going to like it, but the next person will like it. And, you know, it doesn't matter how much you polish it. Someone's not going to like it. It will never be perfect. And, and there is no perfect in music. So, you know, all it is, is, Per, the closest you're ever going to get to perfect is, uh, you know, I think it sounds good today. I, I think it's, I think that's as good as I can do. But if you hear that the next day, you're going to hear 10 things that you would change. Yeah. Like, yeah, uh, I got to redo those guitar parts, you know, and, and as soon as you get into that cycle, it's, it cannot be finished because there will always be something wrong with it. Yeah, but you know what I miss in music is imperfections. Absolutely. That it's like the heartbeat of the of the track. Absolutely. It's why the little demo things we do as composers are things that move us most. There's and there's it's absolutely 
the basis behind that classic dynamic of uh, what's called chasing the demo for your audiences happens all the time is an artist does a little home demo of a song and everybody loves, you know, their his label, the producers, you know, everybody loves the vibe of this thing. And then they go in the studio to do the final, beautiful, polished, perfect version of the thing. And they can't get that excitement. They can't get that magic thread going. It's a perfect recording. Everybody sounds great. Guitars are nice. Great drum sound. And yet it doesn't work. And it's all because music is because of that works because of that inexplicable emotional thing. And most of the time, uh, that inexplicable emotional thing is the imperfection of that writer, the, 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 that it's not sung perfectly. It's yeah. like modern music is so emotionless. It's computer perfect. And, and yet there's, it, it's meaningless. It's, it's disposable music. It's, it's good for like one listen. It's like, Oh, that's, you know, that's, that's an interesting sound and, and boom, you're on to the next thing, but it doesn't become the soundtrack of your life or it doesn't help you feel better about a state of sadness you're in. Uh, it doesn't, it's not healing. It's, it's something. It just sits there. That's yeah. not what I want to be producing. Yeah. Some of the shit's not even worth one listen. Yeah. It's so bad. <laughs> well, a lot of it is not. Yeah. A lot of the stuff. But unfortunately, that's what young kids are being fed these days. And, you know, it's like you, you, if you don't know better, you'll, you'll eat what you're fed. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, I'd like to keep hope alive a little bit for the younger people. And I don't know. It was kind of, it was kind of a toss up. Well, put out your other stuff. Yeah, I need to. I really do need to, you know, I need to, I need to get back in and uh, do some stuff. I really do. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, I think I'm going to let my dog in as long as you have your cat. Yeah, she finally settled down, so now it can now we can swap. <laughs> I love dogs. Yeah, we're dealing with uh, we have an old black lab. Um, she's over twelve, and she's she's excuse me, she's closing in on the end. Unfortunately. Oh man, I hate to hear that. Yeah. Oh wow, I. Had, I'd happily deal with people dying over dogs dying. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my wife say the same thing every day. <laughs> There's a great line from the TV show Yellowstone where the character Rip uh, has to shoot a horse and he just thinks for a second before he pulls the trigger and says, I'd happily shoot a thousand men before I have to kill another horse. Amen. It's just something about animals. They, they don't get trapped in all the BS of life and they keep it really simple. And it's a, a truly unconditional kind of love. They're thrilled to see you every single time you walk in the room, you're thrilled to see them. They pick you up when you're sad. They, keep you level, uh, you know, it's just, uh, and other human beings are difficult. To say the least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To say the very least. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, you know, the, it's really amazing. It's truly amazing. You know, what y'all did with this, um, like you said, that hadn't been done before. You know, you kind of, you kind of created a uh, thing that I don't think anybody will ever even try to live up to because now it's like you said, it all does sound the same. Uh, all the entrance themes they don't stand out. 
characters don't really stand out. You know what I wonder, Andrew, is is this just money talking? You know, is this the classic corporate cycle of things where uh, a company comes up with a great idea, they make a whole lot of money, get really successful, and then at a certain point they they go into cruise control where they're um, – you know, think think about the parallel with Apple. It's not exactly the same, but there are similarities to what I'm trying to say. Where they're not innovating like when Steve Jobs was alive. Yeah, coming up with absolutely uh, products that nobody imagined before. It's not improvements on what existed. It's just a whole new thing. That's what was happening at WWE. It was a whole new thing. There, there, there wasn't, before I was writing entrance theme, there wasn't such a thing as an entrance theme. Mm -mm. Um, and, and I often wonder, is it just cruise control where they feel like, now it's being run by boards and stuff, and they just don't feel like it's that important as long as, like, let's just get the product out there, get some good-looking athletic guys and some nice babes uh, with, you know, uh, with a lot of boobs showing, and, uh, you know, it'll and just put some music to it, and it'd be great, great, great. Or are the people in charge now, do they think – that these themes are are different that that they that they are you know that 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 they are telling the story and there i'm not saying i i'm absolutely confident they're not but i'm just saying is there a perception that it is who knows i don't know yeah. i it's a hard for me to believe that they do but i mean if it it's certainly possible because a lot of people do very mediocre stuff and they think it's absolutely genius. Yep. I don't know. Um, I hope they don't think that they're, <laughs> I think they know. do. I mean, because I, I think that someone in the chain would speak up. What, what I don't understand is obviously Vince is a lover of this sport yeah or entertainment genre mm -hmm. and the 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 kid who um runs aew he Tony Khan. he he is that obviously passionate about it um and grew up on it so i'm sure if he was sitting here talking with us you know, if you asked him, it's like, well, when you were growing up watching WWE, what were some of your favorites? I bet he would go through a bunch of people who had really strong themes and th that they moved him. And yet it it's it's not being applied to his current product. And that that's what is very confusing. It is a huge part, if not the biggest part. And what is missing? I agree. By right. far. It, it, you're certainly never going to get big stars if w without good music. No. You're not. Um, and, you know, maybe that goes back to when they, when they released you. I, I don't know. I remember seeing that. I think it was 2017. Am I right about that? Yeah, at the end of the year. That just kind of blew my mind. Well, there was a guy, uh, very political. There was a guy who was trying to get his own crew of people in there. And, um, you know, he was selling it hard to Triple H and, uh, you know, got them in doing the music of NXT. And uh, he was talking me down. I mean, he was trying to kill me and finally he politically did so. So I was being slowly shut out by uh, being asked to write things, but I was being given no information about who I was writing for. 
and and the other guys were giving all the information. Wow! So, so it was it was a, a grim situation, really unfortunate. And um, but hey, that's that is corporate politics. And if I was a better corporate politician, which I'm not, I'm horrible at it. I'm, you know, I guess I would have fought dirty back and um, because there's plenty I could have done that would have been dirty and yet true. Um, But I, I just, I I just can't do that stuff. It's just like now I, I, I occasionally get requests to do a podcast or an interview or something, but I can tell, you know, people are looking for gossip or they're, they're looking for me to talk people down. And then um, it's like, wow. I mean, um, I was approached by a couple of people to write a book about the, my experiences in the wrestling business. And it's like, talk about something that is never, ever going to happen is my writing a secret backroom tell all book about, uh, you know, the wrestling business. I just won't do that to people. So. Yeah. And anybody should respect that. Well, you know. a lot of people don't. Oh, I know. You know, I mean, a lot of people think that's all you have to offer the world is mm-hmm. the, the secrets, you know, I mean, make no question. There's, there's no question. You know, it, 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 it's so big. Like all the stuff that you did, all those themes. You know, I mean, just go back to the very, like you said, uh, one of the WrestleMania themes. Probably WrestleMania one. Um, probably, yeah. All the way on up, man. Through the, you know, like you said, Steve Austin, The Rock, DX. Uh, Goldust is great. The Undertaker. Goldust was the maze they went for. Oh, my God. There were a lot of that I did that I I thought they'll never go for this. Never, ever, ever, ever. uh, DX. I mean, the whole thing about wrestling themes was, uh, you know, glass break. You know, bell. Undertaker themes. Uh, These these things where there was, you know, I'd come up with the iconic sound and then boom, the theme. And so with DX, I was, when I was putting it together and dealing with uh, Chris Warren's vocal, um, I just loved the sound of his, he had that, you know, that white rap rocker, angry young man vibe in his vocal and which such a great guy. Um, and I just loved his snide way of saying things, you know, like, you think you can tell me what to do? <laughs> you think you're better? And I, I just uh, had him in the studio and we'd already done the main vocal. And, and I just said, like, I want to get a bunch of phrases from him. So I put him in. And he didn't really know what I was talking about. A bunch of phrases. Uh, so I put him in front of his microphone and then I set up uh, another mic looking right at him. And I just set up a, 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 a tempo track relative to the tempo of the song. And I said, I just, I'm going to say a phrase to you and I want you to say it two or three times, but you know, in your way. And then I just started going, making these things up as I went along. And I said, you think you can tell me what to do? You know, and he'd go, you think you can tell me what to do? You think you're better? Well, well you That's better awesome. bow to the master. And then I got sort of the greatest hits of the phrases and put this long intro together, which was completely counterintuitive to uh, it, I mean, it wasn't counterintuitive. It was against the theme law, you know, to have <laughs> an intro that long. But I just loved the whole tease aspect of it. And it's like, how long can you keep an audience on edge and then finally give them the payoff? And, yeah. and Vince went with it. Vince is really, 
you know, he has such a reputation of being such a hard ass. And the truth is he's a hard ass. I mean, some, sometimes he can be just a bully, which I never, it's always disappointed me, but most of the time he was a hard ass when he wasn't getting what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He hired people to do things, uh, you know, to cut together great vignettes or do great promos or, and he'd try to steer them in different directions or, or hope that they would just come up with their own cool creative directions. But when they wouldn't, he'd finally get to a point of just like losing his mind. And it's like, Oh my God. And th then he'd get pissed off and it'd be like, okay, do this, 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 and this, you know, and have it on my desk tomorrow by noon. Um, I always found him to be, you know, if, if you'd be respectful, like he'd ask for something, give him a little something that he would probably ask for and was expecting. Yeah. But if you think you have a better idea, then you then play him this, then say, but I was messing around with another idea and I thought this would be, you know, it, it's not what you asked for, but it sure seems to work to me. Yeah. Um, he was always be completely open to them and, and, and actually really enjoy it. And, you know, he loved to be surprised. It's like, oh my God, you know, there's, you could see him like there, there's no reason why that should work, but that works. Goldust was another one that I didn't think that they'd ever go for that. It's too sweeping, you know, or something. It's too, um, I don't know. You know, it's it's a, a little bit Hollywood, uh, almost like it'd be the theme for a, a glamour girl or something or a romantic movie or um, – but – that's why it works for him. Yeah. I mean, and that's it. And it adds without knowing it, you add, add or draw out a, a, another aspect to someone's character that mm -hmm. makes a much more intriguing character is this, you know, I don't think Goldust went into his character with the gold deal and uh, with, with a little bit of an undercurrent of a deviant sexual thing. But I think the mu the combination of that with his music sort of implied that in some unknowing way. It's like, wait a second, what exactly is going on here? Like, you know, is this guy, you know, is, is this guy just playing the part of this guy in a gold suit or is this guy truly weird? Yeah. I mean, because he seems to really be into the weird thing. Well, you don't get a better storyline than that. Because that's when the audience doesn't know what's he going to do next. Right. Well, it, it was. That was Austin also in, in, in his own way. It was like it was so defiant. You just did not know what he was going to do tonight. So when you heard that music, it's like, okay, buckle up, because God yeah. only knows what happens next. Yeah. And that glass breaking, <laughs> was that you? Yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, he, I mean, it, 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 it seems sort of obvious. It's like he's, that he, he's not a doorbell guy. He's coming through the door. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could you have ever imagined when you wrote that, that just the glass breaking alone, just the reaction that damn thing gets before it's, it's amazing. It, it's amazing. It's amazing. Power of music. It's just amazing. Did you write The Undertakers on the piano? I did. 
as okay. as the, as the most dainty little. Uh, I had tried to write a bunch of stuff, and nothing was sticking. Nothing, you know. I tried rock and roll, and that just made him seem shallow. Mm-hmm. Like there was, there was no mystery to it, and and I was, I. I, because I love kind of mystical, spiritual, otherworldly, godly stuff, um, that was so intriguing to me. It's like a wrestler who's not in your face and not bombastic and, uh, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't find something rel- thankfully very unusual for me. I really could not find something that worked. I mean, I had a little bit of footage of him and just nothing felt like him. And and then suddenly, just out of the blue, I'm sitting at the piano and uh, started playing this little childlike, it's truly childlike. Um, and... And I thought, oh, my God. I mean, I, I was like four notes in, and I said, that's it. That's, you know, that, that I've got to produce it differently. But that's the composition. But, but you know, that what I wrote would become Undertaker's theme. Um, you you wouldn't think it. So here, I'll, I'll give you a demo. Let's see, let's see if this works. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's the piano. But I just wrote wrote way up here high. That's awesome. So then once I had that, I figured, you know, okay, well, how do you present it? Well, it's got to be a gigantic cathedral church organ. Mm -hmm. And probably, you know, the Mormon tabernacle choir should be there. And and then he went through, uh, you know, a lot of the theme kept building as his popularity kept building. We just felt like this... You just got to keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So keep adding organs and bells and choirs. And yeah. He was an incredible character. He's also oh, one man. of the more gracious guys to me. I believe that. Oh, it's just a little bit of an interesting thing to me is uh, extraordinarily few wrestlers ever you know and and I let me preface this not that I was looking for it or expecting it it's just an observation of wow that's a little odd and it's certainly based on the way I'm sure tainted by the way I was raised Uh, but I mean extraordinarily few wrestlers ever reached out and said like, Oh, by the way, you know, thanks for writing that theme for me. It, you know, it really mm. made a difference in my career. Mm. And That's... the, like the only people who did were Mark the undertaker, uh, who was always very gracious, Steve Austin, uh, Chris Jericho, um, uh, Jeff Jarrett, uh, and road dog. Um, but 
I don't, you know, if you're a kid growing up in Pocahontas, Arkansas, particularly with my dad, you know, if, if someone opens a door for you, you say thank you. Right. Um, yes. You know, it's just, it, it, it almost doesn't matter if you don't think they opened the door very well. You still say thank you. Yeah. Uh, so it's, I don't know, you know, I guess I always wrote it off to, it's kind of the tough guy image. You, you don't, you don't thank people because to do that is you're giving away power or you know, you're, you're showing weakness when you, when you say thank you. And of course I feel the exact opposite. You're you sure sh- show strength when you're grateful to people. That is uh disappointing to hear that. Well, you know, I, I, hey, I, you know, I, I think there are a lot of reasons why, and I'm sure some of them are just circumstantial is that they're out Maybe. of the road and I, I don't run into them a lot. Maybe. Yeah. Sometimes you go the extra mile, you know, <laughs> I think. I think too. Yeah. You know, I think it's, I think it's important, particularly, you know, if, 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 for the, people in our lives who who had who really changed something you know about our lives who had a, a real impact because it's um, it's not a particularly common thing as we go through our lives when they brought sting in and they did the big presentation uh, with all the people with their face painted on the stage, you know, hitting the drums and his kind of, it was kind of a rendition of the crow thing in WCW, I believe, but it was kind of different. Do you remember working on that? No, I didn't have anything to do with that. You know, and, and because I didn't have, you know, I didn't write his original music from, yeah. Um, so I remember him coming in and it was big news and, but, I also vaguely remember that uh, certainly that it didn't fall flat, but that he came in and it wasn't at all the huge blow up redefining WWE thing that some people were expecting because I think he was the big dog in a smaller pond. And when he got over to WWE, it's like, okay, you're a popular guy, but you're trying to be a popular guy in, uh, you know, in a pool that has a lot of really popular guys. Um, so I, it, it's inter- It's It was sort of interesting. Is he still in the game? Oh, man. He's jumping off of balconies on in aw right now it's it's amazing really wow good for him wow god don't get hurt sting if you're listening jeez be careful yes please <laughs> please he's one of my favorites ever um vince's theme no chance in hell yeah that's yeah. one of the funnest ones man and just having him come out there and doing that that's so fun uh he I, I'm, I'm not sure anyone comes out and has more fun playing it up to his theme. Just with, you know, he sticks his chest down and he, he just makes that come alive. Like you've got, I, do give me your worst. I guarantee you I'm the last one standing. Yeah. And it tends to be accurate, by the way. But he really, I, I think overall, time tested, he's the best talent, the, the best on air talent in WWE history. Oh, yeah. Because he is not afraid to look foolish, mm-hmm. you know, to truly play his character of the guy who is so outlandishly. Uh, egotistical that you know 
he doesn't even know that he's been bested when he gets bested, that he still <laughs> feels he's won. <laughs> yeah. That's what makes it so entertaining. But but you have to be like I, I think very secure in yourself to to pull that off. You know, and I don't think a lot of those guys are. It's a that's a very egotistical world. Yeah, no doubt. Mm. Well it, it's it's great. Uh that whole and the beginning thing of it, the sweeping thing that before the song actually kind of hits. Yeah. Did you, was that your idea that you kind of put that in there to kind of give it like a, here it comes, here it comes, boom, and then go into it? Yeah, that's all uh, scratching on guitar strings. Okay. Yeah. Wow, I wouldn't have, it sounded like a, a keyboard oh, he- thing. He- heavily affected. Wow. I, I think, I, yeah, I think there also is a keyboard mixed in there too, but okay. uh, that sort of. Yeah. 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 There's some, I remember there's some guitar scratches. I don't know. You know, one of the more intriguing things of having written so many different compositions over such a long time is that the fan base, how well the fan base knows my music. And oh, yeah. a lot of times over the years, I would get an email saying, uh, particularly when we were releasing the CDs. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my God, I can't, I can't believe you released that version of that theme. I liked the one that was before that, that had the, the guitar on the second verse, and then the tambourine comes in. And I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? There is no guitar <laughs> on the second verse, and there is no tambourine. Well, sure <laughs> enough. I go back and boom, there's a guitar on the second verse and a tambourine. And it, it's, and you know, it'd be things like I didn't even think about releasing that version. I mean, because I, I, I thought this was the only version, you know, the one I released. So, wow. It, it was, it never came down to like whatever you guys want. I don't care, but we're not releasing the version that has the guitar on the second verse with the tambourine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a big, it wasn't like a planned thing. Yeah. Like, ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, man, you know, I don't know how you feel about the hall of fame, but if anybody from WWE is listening for God's sakes, please, induct jim johnston in the wwe hall of fame if anybody should ever be in it should be him oh well i don't you know my god i'm wondering if that ship has sailed and um the it's it it's sort of uh i don't know it's so you know it's kind of a weird thing i i from early on i wish that they had truly kept the Hall of Fame, a Hall of Fame. And early on, or somewhat early on, when they started to, you know, put like people like Pete Rose in, who yeah. were just a guest at a WrestleMania. Yeah. That, you know, I, I don't want to take anything away from those, a lot of wonderful people who got involved in storylines and had some fun. But if a Hall of Fame is going to have meaning, it truly has to be a Hall of Fame. It has to be really hard to get into. It's like, if you know, if someone is in the Hall, of, it's like getting the Medal of Honor mm-hmm. if you're a soldier. If someone has a Medal of Honor, they didn't just kiss up to the general just right. It's like, you know, that guy did something outlandishly brave, beyond yeah. your imagination brave. Um and so, and that's why other soldiers, when they see a guy wearing a Medal of Honor, boy, they, they're at attention and saluting and it's the real deal. Um, that's the way it should be for any Hall of Fame. And some sports do it pretty well. I, I think, you know, in a lot of sports, it's, it's hard to get into the Hall of Fame. You know, it's just like, it's, it's hard to win an Oscar. Yeah. You know, there's uh, in Oscars. Are there politics? Yeah, there are politics, but they don't hand them out to losers because people think you know she's a nice girl. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or popular. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to have done something really, really good. Right. Well, what have you been working on these days? Um, procrastinating, putting stuff out. <laughs> well, I, I'm with you there. <laughs> um, all sorts of stuff. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, orchestral stuff. A lot of sort of movie soundtracky stuff. Um, uh, some new songs that I've. Uh, that I've liked. Um, um, boy, one of which you should do. It'd be great. To, I just thought of that. But Send it my way. Right up your alley. Guitar cry for me. Mm. Um, hey, send it my way. I, I want to hear it. Um, but but all style uh, genre and stylistically all over the map. But it's you know it, it there was definitely a period um, after it inspired me where I was both happy to be done with this, but also there's just a shock value of you of habit. I mean humans are very habitual um, and. You're doing something for 32 years and suddenly you're not doing it. You know, that's going to up, uh, upset the apple cart in your life. No matter, it doesn't matter if you don't want it to. Um, you know, it's, it's like getting a divorce. It, it doesn't matter if you were the one who wanted the divorce. Uh, after you get divorced, you're going to go through all those steps that the psychologists say you're going to go through. You're going to go through. It isn't just the person who got dumped. It's you too are going to go through, you know, sadness and anger and resentment and, you know, depression. And uh, there, there are, there are no free rides for human beings. We, we all are subject to these kind of absolute laws of emotion. So, I, I at at first I was I really wanted like you know I'm gonna just keep working and work right through this and you know just and it's you know what should have been not surprising it took a while to sort of find a new way of being of working of of uh, it, it was like an overload of freedom I mean. Fortunately, I, uh, you know, saved my money. So there wasn't an immediate, uh, need to like, I've got to go out and get work. Sure. All afternoon. Um, but suddenly being able to work on whatever I wanted to work on is sort of a backfire kind of thing because mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? So what am I going to work on? What yeah. do you, you know, now that you can write whatever you want to write, that's an interesting question. What do you want to write? And yeah. uh, so it took a while to uh, kind of kick the habit in a way and um, and to, to, to get back into writing and really kind of rediscover my... Uh, kind of a purity in love of music and love of writing music, which was, which then became an incredibly enlightening, positive thing. So, and that's where it is now. It's and and now I'm, I'm, uh, I've sort of gone the other direction where I, I've been so blessed to have this seemingly uh, endless pool of ideas. So the my biggest challenge is focusing on, on one and finishing it. Because while I'm working on this one, I get 12 different ideas to go this way and that. And it's like, um, and it, having the discipline um, is challenging for me. But I'm getting better. I totally relate. I've got 
stuff jotted down in my voice memos on my phone and the notepad. Just like I try to keep them organized in a folder. Hey, I need to go back and work on this, finish this song. And, you know, some of them I do. Some of them I'll, it gives me an idea for something better. Uh, I totally relate to all that. Uh, a couple of questions, and uh, I'm going to let you get out of here, Jim. Uh, Alex S. wants to know which entrance theme do you think has earned you the most money? <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Gee, Alex, I, I, I don't know, but uh, certainly I'm thinking, you know, the biggest stars that got the most airtime uh, because you uh, royalties are paid just on its simple math. You know, whatever plays the most on TV, you get certain number of pennies per minute of playing. So, if it plays a lot, you get a lot of pennies. So, uh, you know, maybe Undertaker only because he tended to have longer entrances because his entrances were very uh, uh, drawn out, relatively speaking, and they, you know, kill the lights and the uh, whole deal. So um, that would be my guess. But I don't know. The Rock had long entrances and because he would go to the four corners 50 times sometimes because the reaction would be so um, incredible. That was always really exciting. When, when I got to say, Rock really knew how to work the crowd. And, and particularly later on when he would only come back sort of for guest appearances. Man, when he came back, the crowd would just light up. And, and boy, did he know how to work them. And then when he, I, I just loved, I was such a sucker. I I don't like that much about it, but there are a few things that really get me. Uh, and his thing when, you know, you can tell he's on the storyline ride up that's going to lead ultimately to finally, <laughs> you know, the rock has come back to wherever he is. And you're just sitting there like a puppy dog waiting for him to get home to that point. And then when he does, it's like Nirvana. Uh, ben L. This is kind of a, f a famous thing for some reason um, from a lot of people, but Ben L. Wants to know, how did you come up with the deuce and domino theme? I, I don't. <laughs> You're kidding me. I have no idea. I have no <laughs> recollection whatsoever. Uh, Why is that a popular thing? I have no idea. It's not a popular thing with me, evidently. I'm sorry, Ben. Uh, I, I complete strikeout for you on that one. <laughs> well, uh, man, I really appreciate you talking to us here. Had a had a really good time talking with you. I've always wanted to talk with you uh, for years, many years now. Just kind of. Well, thank you very much. I'm finally. I'm glad that we finally had a chance to uh, sit down together. It's 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 nice. It's uh, sort of takes me back to my southern roots. It's a, it's a a much more. It's, it's, a, it's a. There's a way of conversing in the south. You know, it's people are much more willing to let things unfold over time. Whereas in New York and L.A., it's boom, 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 fast. Yeah. Agendas. And, uh, you know, in L.A. particularly, it's to find out as quickly as possible. Is there any way that knowing you is going to help my career? Oh, yes. And as soon as they find out that probably not like, hey, I got to run. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, as always, uh, if you liked the episode today, please leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts because it greatly, greatly helps out the podcast and getting it out there to other fans such as yourself. Also, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Just type in Andrew Pope Music or YouTube.com slash Andrew Pope Music. 
uh, subscribe there so you don't miss any any shows and videos and maybe some future music. Who knows? Who knows what I'll put on there? You never know. There you go. Thank All you. Right. It's been great to be with you. Yes, sir. We we appreciate it, and we thank y'all for tuning in to picking it out, and we'll see you next time.